Welcome to Rider Nation Station, presented by American Manufacturing Solutions, your total logistics partner, investing in Rider Nation Station and St. Mary's, Ohio, and to our other fine sponsors. Welcome to Rider Nation Station, presented by American Manufacturing Solutions, your total logistics partner, investing in Rider Nation Station and St. Mary's, Ohio, and to our other fine sponsors. Clothes. Everybody likes to get new clothes. Parents hate to wash the clothes and get them put away. And they really hate when the clothes start looking worn and tattered. But what do you do when your new and favorite clothes get stains, oil, grease, etc. on them? Which unfortunately, unfortunately seems to be an everyday occurrence for me. Well, take it to the local dry cleaner, of course. And fortunately for St. Mary's, there was a family owned dry cleaning business for over 70 years. No, this wasn't Jefferson Cleaners owned by George Jefferson. However, to discuss the history of Paris cleaners and what the actual business was like, I've invited Bob Herm to discuss with us what it was like to own the dry cleaning business for the people of St. Mary's. Bob, thanks for being here for us. Yeah, you're welcome. So the first question before we even talk about the history is, I've always taken clothes to the dry cleaner. However, the only thing I know is I give them my clothes and I get this little ticket, which my sister just found uh, in my mother's collection, and I walk away. And then I come back with the ticket and I pick it back up. So talk to me, what happens in between me dropping the clothes off and me picking the clothes back up? Well. Uh... The first thing is that your clothes are handled 14 times before they're finished. The first thing, uh, we uh, meet your mother or the, at the counter, we give her her ticket, we take the garments, we either put them in a bag if we're not ready to mark them in at that time, and we wait till we get our other work finished before we mark them in, and then we'll mark them in and we'll uh, put a tag on each one with a number, that number there. And, uh, and we'll have a, the ca a tag will be a certain color. Different colors represent the day that the garment is due when the customer is gonna come back in after it. Whether it's the same day, which would be a white ticket, which is quick service, or a blue ticket, which was Monday, mm -hmm. red was Tuesday, and so on. Then it would go to the uh, back on a pile, and then it'd go in a cart, and it'd go back to the back end. The cleaner in the back would come up and get it, wheel it back there. Then uh, she or he would pre-spot the clothes if they were gonna clean them at that time. And pre-spotting is where you uh, look at the clothes on a spotting board and if you see a stain, you spot it and you break it loose. Uh, and, and that's really an important key on putting out good quality is pre-spotting. And then the clothes would be sorted sometimes by color, uh, sometimes by fabric and they'd go into the cleaning machine. The cleaning machine would uh, uh, inject a clean solvent, uh, and it would also inject a soap to help break the dirt and stuff. Is the cleaning machine kind of like a big washing machine? Yes, uh-huh. Yeah, it's, it's the, one we, the last one we had was 75 pounds, and it was uh, tall as the ceiling. Huh. And uh, it was probably this wide. But anyways, it went in there for a cycle and it brought the solvent in, cleaned it, the clothes, dumped the solvent out, brought in fresh solvent and washed in there, and then dumped that out. And then uh, it would uh, spin and get the uh, liquid out of there as much as it could. Then the, the drying phase would kick in and the heating steam would heat the coils and the air and uh, they would go dry the clothes. The solvent would go to the uh, downstairs, or g would go to a dist distillation machine, which was called DynaClean. Uh, that DynaClean probably was the key to our, uh, why we always had pure solvent. They, the manufacturer, that, was, that DynaClean was made by General Motors. They okay. used it up there to clean oil and grease off of their parts before they painted them. Uh, somehow somebody in the dry cleaning business or salesman or somebody got wind of it and they started making them. And I happened to catch a hold of that and I thought, man, 
I'd have clean solvent every time, every load. And it was so, it was so nice that I could clean a load of dirty gloves, grease and everything on them, and the next load I could clean a wedding gown, and the wedding gown would come out done. fine. Because it was, and the manufacturer of the, of the Dynaclean said that it makes the solvent cleaner than when you buy it new. So we did that, that happened all day long, and it was a fast distillation. We could, the solvent that we used in the previous load, by the time this next load is finished, that solvent would be already cleaned, and then it would go back downstairs into a holding tank. Then when the machines ran again with the next load, it would pump it up and put fresh solvent in again. It was great. Hmm. It was great. And then after their clothes come out of the cleaner, we we put them on, go through the spotting board to see if we missed anything. We maybe be able to spot that out or pre-spot it and have to rerun it again. Or sometimes you spot it and you leave it hang to let the chemical work on the stain. Then it goes to the, uh, uh, we had a steam cabinet. We ran a lot of the suit coats, sport coats through the cabinet, raincoats to soften them up and make them easier to press and get a lot of the wrinkles out. Then they'd go down a conveyor uh, to the, uh, one went to the, the dresses went to the dress department, uh, the trouser went to the trouser department, and the sport coats went to the sport coat department. And uh, then from there, it'd get back on another conveyor, an automatic worm gear conveyor. It'd take them up front to the girls to bag them. Well, they would look at the garment, get the ticket number, and they had their tickets, they spread out on the ticket holders up here at Clip. And they would go put the clothes there, each one where it belonged, and then after that order was filled, they'd take it over to the bagging rack, put it on the bagger and bag them, and put a plastic bag on them, and put the ticket on it, the sales invoice. And then I would walk through the door, Yep. and show the ticket, and yep. I would get, uh, get my garments. Yes, and we would okay. go by your last name and uh, the number. Like I said, I've just always dropped off and picked up and never knew what happened in between. And when you, when you mentioned the wedding gown, did you ever have that customer come in in a frenzy that something just happened and they, they had an emergency that they needed to go to a dance or something and they needed you to help right away? Did you ever have any of those oh, situations we, yeah, over, we had over that. your career? Every once in a while we had that. And uh, it, it even happened sometimes when we were had the bowler off, you know, we we're through cleaning and the boiler was cold, and they had to have it, so we would start the boiler up, and we did it. Always fair. We might lose money then, but maybe they'll come back and a be a good customer. Customer satisfaction. Yep. See, so, definitely. And I've even come in uh, on Saturday and Sunday when we were closed at night. Uh, they forgot to pick up their wedding dress for Friday <laughs> night. They forgot to pick it up for the wedding. See. Kind of. So important. that happened. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Well, let's get into the history. And, and it's my understanding, Bob, that Paris Cleaners started an operation in 1929 with a partnership between your father and Andy Bergman. Yes. And how did these two recent graduates, I think they graduated in 27? Um, I think my dad graduated in 27, and I think Andy might have been 28 or 29. I'm not okay. real sure. Okay. So how did those two... They, they were I friends. I mean, they're young. Yeah. How did they get together and say, let's start a dry cleaning business in St. Mary's, Ohio? Well, what happened was, I think before Dad graduated from high school, I don't know if he was a junior or what, he worked for that sudatorium out of Lima. They had a pickup station here in town, and I think it was where the Necky sewing machine was in that area, Wilson sewing machine. Uh -huh. I think it was in that area. They had a pickup station. Uh, Dad worked there. He ran a cash register. He took the clothes in. He tagged them, he put them in a big cart, uh, he took them down to the depot, and uh, on the depot they, they loaded them on the, uh, the trolley car, I think, or the, either the trolley car or the train, I'm not sure mm -hmm. which, and shipped them to Lima at, at uh, Seals Cleaners, Glenmore Seals. And he cleaned them and spotted them up there. They sent them back, and Dad got them, and uh, he would press them. And if there was any tears or things like that, he would sew them. I remember he had a black Singer sewing machine, a treadle. And we still had that when I retired. I'll be done. That same machine, treadle with a leather belt on it. It was a nice machine. Anyways, uh, um, and then Dad did that, and, uh, and I remember Dad telling me that uh, 
one time uh, uh, after Dad and Andy owned the place, they, uh, they bought, I guess, Glenmore out, and they owned it, but they still sent them up there. And uh, uh, one Saturday night, um, Jimmy Cook was working for him, and he was running a cash register. Emil Marks went by the store and looked in, and he saw Jimmy in there sleeping. So Emil snuck in, picked up the cash register, and took the cash register. <laughs> then he called Dick and Andy, and uh, they all went down there and went over the cash register. <laughs> and Dad, where's the cash register? Well, he didn't know. It should have been here. I was here the whole time. Uh, it was funny. Shoot. Yeah. Um, they teased a lot back in those days. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Good fun. Was it always called Paris Cleaners? Uh, yes, it was. And how did they come up with Paris uh, Cleaners? Dad and Andy ran a contest uh, to see who could come up with a name that would be chosen. And, uh, and uh, it was Alton Kellemeyer that came up with the name. Paris Paris cleaners and distinction. Paris cleaners and dyers of distinction, because years ago they used to do a lot of dye work, and I think they sent that to Chicago, to, to a dye house. And they okay. dyed the clothes, uh, and uh, for the winner of the contest out in Kalamar, he received either five dollars or ten dollars. I think five. I'm not sure. Uh huh. Uh -huh. So that's how that name came out. Very interesting. Did you ever hear how he came up with Paris? No, uh, I'm not sure how Elton did. You know, I never talked to him about it or his son. Yeah. I never thought about that. I wished I would have now. Yeah. And I don't think, I don't recall ever talking to dad. How did Kelly uh, happen to think of that? So they start the store in 29. And wh where was the original location? It was downtown St. Mary's, correct? It was downtown uh, where Wilson's, and it wasn't called Paris Cleaners then. I don't know when they made it Paris Cleaners. If they had it Paris Cleaners before they moved to the new location, and that was over 207 West Spring Street. They had their cleaning machine in the front window. At that time, they used carbon tetrachloride, uh, which I guess wasn't real good stuff. Okay. And, um, and the machine was in the front window. And then they bought a, a new machine. It was a 15-pounder, and you put the clothes in the top, it was like a washing machine, just did that. And, uh, and it was called a SEC, S-E-C. And when you mentioned the pounds, is, is that how many pounds of clothing that you can put in Yes, uh-huh. So you mentioned earlier, 75 pounders, right. so you put up yeah, to 75. I, 75 is pretty, I don't think any, very few people in the state of Ohio, a few cleaners had a 75 pounder. Okay. So they start off where Wilson's uh, was located on, on Spring Street, and they were there for about 10 years? Something. No, I'd say they were there, let's see, 29. The fire was, in, yeah, let's see. No, they, they were there in, uh, they, were there only, they weren't there long. Okay. Because in the book I had there that the, uh, in 1939 it burnt down, 29, they said from 29 to 39. Now, I'm assuming that they were in that place at 29. So yeah. When they bought, because Glenmore probably closed that up, I'm guessing. Okay. And, and any idea how the fire started? Uh, I asked Dad, he says, you know, I'm not sure, but we think maybe he left the doggone steam iron plugged in and didn't have it tipped up or something or it knocked over. I don't know. That's what he thinks. And it was a total loss. Yeah, it was. Okay, so then they have to relocate. Yeah. And, and where do they relocate? 207 West Spring Street, and that uh, was right across from the fire department. So and the old fire department uh, was, where Wilson uh, Law building is on the corner yes. now. Yes, uh-huh. Okay, so today it would be where the dance studio is? Yes, uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. And so they operate there from? Uh, 1929 till, uh, say, I bought Dad out. I started working for him in about 1971. Or no, 70, 79 we built the new store. Okay. Uh-huh. So 1939, 40 to 1979 located of the second store on Spring Street. Right. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. So as a youngster, did you uh, work in the store? I did. Um, every Saturday, I got to go down and wash the windows. And uh, we didn't have hot water, so I took a bucket of water, and I go downstairs, and they had a hose, a rubber hose sitting there by the bottom of the steps. I'd turn a valve, and stick the hose in the bucket of water, turn a valve, and steam would come out. And that steam would 
uh, get hot and get the water hot. Mm -hmm. So then uh, I took it back up and I got my brush and I got my squeegee and I got to wash the windows. I did it all winter long. I made 35 cents, man. That was good money. I loved that 35 That's... cents. And I was allowed to spend it what I wanted to. Of course, I bought too many candy bars as usual. Yeah. And where would have you bought those candy bars from? I bought them from uh, Jake Barron's uh, grocery store just uh, one block west next to the Shell Station. Okay. And uh, the two Gretz boys owned it before, I think, uh, uh, Jake Barron did. And Jake Barron had cookies in there. I've always remembered these cookies. And to this day, I still look when I see a cookie store. They were rectangle cookies, and they were real soft and bendy like this, and they're about that long. I loved them. Huh. I'll tell you about Jake. When I come home from school, I'd walk home from the school Holy Rose about a mile, and I'd stop in his grocery store, and I'd get a candy bar, and I'd charge it on my dad and mom's bill. <laughs> One time, uh, Mr. Barron called my mother, and he says, do you know that your son Bobby is stopping in here every day buying a candy bar and charging it to your account? And she says, no. <laughs> so they put, that put an end to it. it. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. The good yeah. thing had to come to an end. Yeah. What, what did you like about stopping in uh, to your father's store when you were uh, Well, the kid? first thing is it got me, we got warm. We stop in there. And then one time we started walking to school, it was 26 below zero. And we got a, a block away and Mrs. Fortman, Mrs. Bernard Fortman, uh, oh, the kid, one of the kids came out and says, there's no school day, it's been canceled. We didn't believe them. We didn't believe the kids and thought they were teasing us. Uh -huh. So Mrs. Fortman came out and said, no, it is. But what we liked is we could stay up there and get warmed, get heated, warmed sure. up. And then we'd walk down to the post office, which was uh, the uh, city, city, the building. library was in the basement. We'd go in there and we'd get warm. Then sometimes we'd stop in at Jolly's uh, Donut Shop close to just on the other side of uh, uh, Anderoni's store. Okay. And either we'd get a donut uh, or we would just get warm and then go on to school. Okay. I don't know how long it took us, but we did a lot of stopping <laughs> when it was cold. <laughs> yes, definitely. My sister and I. Did you have a least favorite thing other than washing windows? But of course you made 35 cents to wash I'm, the yeah. windows. I, no. Uh, well, later on I had to clean out when I got older, I cleaned, I swept the floor. Every morning I'd get there before dad did, and I'd sweep the floor. And uh, I would, on Saturdays, I would uh, clean the filter out. And there was a lot of muck and yeah. uh, powder like in there. And, uh, you know, and I cleaned that up. And I, you know, I, I didn't mind it. I never, okay. I always worked. I mean, I did things for my dad. And, so as you're, you're in high school at Memorial and, and you're, you're thinking about what your next steps are, were you always thinking, someday I'm going to take over no, the dry cleaning No, I never business? wanted to be a dry cleaner. Okay. Never. Never. Uh, I, and the reason I didn't is because my dad made me press my own clothes. I wanted to be out playing with sure. the kids and doing other stuff, but he made me press my own. So that's, I never wanted to be a dry I never thought I would. So how did it evolve that you did become the dry cleaner? Well, after I got out of college, uh, I went to the Army. And then I got out of the Army. I came back, and I got a job at Goodyear on a Freddie McCabe in merchandise. I worked there two and a, about two, two and a half years. And I thought uh, I wanted to try something else. And I went down to Minster, and I uh, was hired to teach high school down there. I yeah. taught law and economics, bookkeeping two, typing one, uh, girls' federal education, uh, girls' uh, basketball. Uh, I uh, uh, was a. I started a boys' track team down there. I ended up being assistant football coach down there. Uh, one of the kids wanted me to start a military cadets club, so we did that. I'll be darned. And um, uh, I took the girls, the CYO or C G A A girls. I took them uh, snow skiing at Bell Fountain. And I also took them to uh, uh, oh, uh, ice skating at Hobart Arena. Uh -huh. Then I took my economics class to Lima to that small stock exchange they had up there. And I just, I really had fun. Yeah. That was actually probably the best job I had, the most fun. So then a, a definite divergent path occurred when you left teaching my dad to take over the business. Yeah, he, I, I just... He asked me if I would help him come in and work for him. Uh, he had to have open heart surgery. 
Uh. So I did. And he says, you can always go back. And I did. And, and he let me pay the bills, write the checks and mm -hmm. that stuff. And, and I just liked doing it. I was, uh, I was always a hard worker like my mother was. And uh, I liked doing it. Yep. And uh, I remember one time um, he said, we're going to cut a melon today. I said, what's that? He said, I'll show you. He said, we got all the bills paid for and we got a little extra money in the checking account. And uh, I'm going to I'm writing out a check for five hundred dollars for myself. I'll put it in the bank and save it. So and I liked it. I like doing that. And I like talking to my dad. My dad was always my best friend. Uh -huh. uh, I had three sisters and, and I was always outnumbered. Dad and I were always outnumbered <laughs> four against two. But uh, dad and I were best buddies because we matched. I don't know what I. Yep. And uh, so I always liked doing stuff with him. And he'd go someplace I always wanted to go with him. And, uh, and then uh, when I got into the cleaning business, I liked it. And he explained that I went to dry cleaning school first before I started working for it. Because I wanted to go to the school that teaches it. And, uh, and then I could come back and work on my dad. And, and uh, my dad was a pretty sharp fella. And a lot of times I'd be at the spotting board when I got back and I just couldn't get these spots out. And I'd be, he says, look, just take this garment and set it aside. And, and your subconscious mind will think about it. You do your other work and get those clothes out. Otherwise, we'll have a quagmire here. So I did that. And then gradually, by that chemical that I put on there, it was working the stain, which I didn't realize. And then when I got back to it, I had plenty of time. I'd take my time and drive different things on it. And he would show me and tell me. And... And, uh, and then I, I remember when I came back and I started doing the spotting, I changed the chemicals around, put them in different places and different chemicals and got some new stuff from what the school said. And he said, boy, he said, you're getting me all mixed up here. <laughs> how, how long was the schooling for you? Say that again, How please? long was the schooling, uh, the dry cleaning schooling? Was it a six I, month, I, one year? I think it was uh, uh, four or five months okay. in the fall. All righty. Yeah. Well, we're going to take a break and uh, see who our sponsors are that help make Rider Nation Station a possibility. We're going to come back with this day in history and continue with the interview about Bob's specific time in the dry cleaning business. We'll be right back. This segment of tonight's broadcast has been brought to you by Mr. Bank, helping people achieve financial success and support of the Rider Nation and the St. Mary's community. The Evening Leader, chronicling the history of St. Mary's for over 100 years. And like a good neighbor, Lori Yelton, your local State Farm agent, is there. This Day in History brought to you by our fine sponsors. Please stop in to see these fine folks and stay local the best you can. Tell them thanks for supporting Rider Nation Station. This Day in History, we're going to go back to Saturday, May 7th, 1927. And again, thanks to the Evening Leader for helping make this possible. Front page news. May 7, 1927. 90 crappies caught by two Dayton men fishing at Lake St. Mary's this week. J.E. Linneman and A. Bruggeman spent three days fishing in the lake and were more than pleased with the success, and they are determined to return to the lake. Also, West Ohio Road Company gets contract of oiling streets. They submitted the lowest bid of 7.74 cents a gallon for oil to be applied to the unpaved streets and it will be sometime in the month of May. Three bids were received by the service director, William Henschen. Last year, four carloads of oil, approximately 30,000 gallons, were applied. MHS entrants in All Glaze County Field and Track Meet are leading in Class A. Memorial High School has 56 points compared to Wapakoneta's 21 points. And folks, that was the Class A division. Other schools in Class B that are participating are Waynesfield, New Knoxville, New Bremen. Not participating, but eligible, are Crydersville, Buckland, New Hampshire, and Minster. In the half mile run, Larkin of St. Mary's fell exhausted five yards from the goal, uncertain if he will be able to compete in the one mile run. In the pole vault, Memorial High School boys, Williams, Noble, and Hall tie for first at nine foot six inches. Gordon State Park, which is under new management, will be open for a peep-in on May 8th with Bob's Buckeye Buddies of Sydney, Ohio at the pier. 
Grand opening of the entire park, May 28th, Lloyd Smith and his recording orchestra are coming direct from New York City. And finally, West School pupils win much applause for operetta given at the high school auditorium. Performed the Scouts Trip to Fairyland as a last day program last evening at Memorial High School Auditorium, dainty and clever costumes, clear speaking, and pretty singing made the children's entertainment a very successful one. The grade school orchestra made its first public appearance last night and won the distinct approval of the audience. There we have it, May 7th, 1927. And 1927 was the year your father graduated from high school, correct? Yes, uh-huh. And that is the reason that we used Chose that, that year. You. All righty, Bob, we talked a, a lot about how Paris Cleaners got started with your father and you as a youngster. And um, now we're going to talk specifically about your time um, with Paris Cleaners. Now, the thing that I found uh, out just a little bit before we went on was it just wasn't a St. Mary's store. You had multiple stores in, mm -hmm. in the dry cleaning business. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, I bought out a total of 10 stores over the years. Uh, there was one, a leather company in Ovid, Michigan. There was a leather company in uh, Columbus, Ohio. I bought out of dry cleaners in Sydney, bought out of dry cleaners in Walpock, bought out of dry cleaners in New Bremen, bought out one in uh, Minster, um, and uh, f four in Lima. And uh, we had, with the new store that we had, we didn't do that until after we got in the new store, mostly. And the new store was located where? Uh, 1975 Solana Road. We built that in 79. Uh, and uh, we were growing. We bought maybe a couple out before that. And we just didn't have room in the store that, that I bought from mom and dad. And so uh, this new store uh, gave us a lot more room. We had room. I, that we could walk, we had clothes hanging on the house, we could walk on either side of them. And the old store, we couldn't do that. We had to always shove the clothes aside, and uh, that sometimes you mess them up or you're afraid mm -hmm. you'll mess them up. It, and it's interesting, um, and I really haven't thought about this, but um, the old store shut down in 79, uh, or you, you closed that one in 79, moved to the new one. Uh -huh. I was eight years old, and, and I have recollections of going in with mom to, to pick up the dry wow. cleaning there. So. Wow. It's kind of fun reliving that little bit there. So the leather, help, help a novice like me in, in this, uh, this concept. Does leather go hand in hand with dry cleaning or was that just some specialized area that you went off well, that other dry cleaners didn't? That was kind of a specialized area because dry cleaners couldn't clean their own leather. Could it, it took special equipment. Now I got onto this, the sale, I bought a new cleaning machine uh, just a, a year or so after uh, I bought mom and dad out in 71. And uh, uh, the salesman was a guy from Columbus. His name was Harold Leist. And uh, I just liked the guy. I liked his voice. I trusted him, what he mm -hmm. was telling me. And, uh, and he, he was I, showing me a 30 pound Marvell cleaning machine. It was a transfer unit. That means you clean the clothes in that unit, then you take them out of their wet after they spin extract, and then you put them in a tumbler like you do uh -huh. at home on a washing machine. Whereas the, uh, the other machine that I had to dry to dry, they went in dry and they came out dry. That was also a marvel that I bought from him. But I liked the gentleman and uh, I, I, he invited me down to his store in Columbus. He, had a, he was an older fella and he had a young guy by the name of Forrest Lyons. And Forrest Lyons was a big, strong guy and a heck of a baseball player, really good baseball player. And he looked like uh, Bruto. Uh, I'm trying to think uh, on uh, with Popeye and them, I think. Oh. <laughs> I think he looked like him, man. And I mean, he was a heck of a ball player. Anyways, they were partners and they had a leather cleaning shop there. And uh, I remember Dad and I going down there and looking and uh, looking at those beautiful, all le different leather coats, different colors, great smell of them, it smelled yeah. good and uh, freshly refinished. Uh, and uh, 
and because and, Harold wanted me to get in the business and uh, get in the leather business that says there's a, a market out there and you can do it. So I came back and Dad and I talked about it and Dad always said that, you know, one thing I worry about, he says, I've been in the business 45 years and he says, I've seen things come and go, fads, and this could be, right. that could happen. And as it turned out, that did happen. Uh, but um, I, uh, I rented the, I had, I, I didn't have the space in my cleaning shop to do that. So I rented the building where Richard Ike had his insurance office. I rented the east section of it, the east side of it. And that's owned by now by Lorger's Insurance. Okay. So we built, I had Lee Schreer come in there and he built a boiler room for me in the basement. And we had a trap door on the outside that we had a record. We, Ron Reed lowered the boiler in through the outside. We got it in there and hooked it up and got the presses in there. And, uh, and Harold sold me some presses and besides that new cleaning machine. And the cleaning machine he told me was another transfer, only it was a 40 pounder. And it was, uh, it was with perk, the same as what I had before. And, uh, and we put, uh, after this, we had the solvent in there, we put a few gallons of dye in there to, so that it wouldn't be so strong to pull the color out of the garments. And, uh, it would, and we also had oil in there, keep the, so, keep the leather oil soft. Then we had presses there, so we started out there. And I, I got it, didn't have any leather coats. I got in the truck and I uh, took my uh, gear, whatever I needed, and I went and I made a route and I started a route. And I was going all day, calling on cleaners up in uh, Lima and further north. And all of my last stop, I think, was over in Salina at Delbert Smith, who was a uh, eventually, uh, uh, several years ago, was a competitor of mine here, okay. and Delbert gave me three or four coats, and he's the first guy to give them to me, and uh, that just made me feel good that he'd trust me. Yeah, see, that I would be back and I would do a good job, and that's how we got started. And it gradually it grew, and then gradually I didn't have time to do that, so I hired somebody to run the route, so I could be back at the store sure. making sure things are right. Then uh, I may I might have started another route in a different area and did the same thing, and uh, but that's how we got started. Interesting, yeah. And you know, as you're away, somebody's got to be running the store, yeah, right. which then makes me think: how many total employees did you have at, at the height of? At the height, we had fifty-four. Yeah, Excellent. fifty-four. Excellent. You know, and Sunday nights, I used to say to Carol, I say, you know, honey. I wish it was Monday morning because I want to go to work. I just like it so much. Yeah. And I've got a lot to do this week and I want to get started on it. And I really liked it. Yep. And especially having that new store, it was so much nicer. Mm -hmm. The air was much better and uh, more room, clean, new. It was just nice. I remember when uh, I was building the store after the construction got finished, I had a lot of pipes put up. And uh, Milt Colvin was an electrician from Goodyear. And he used to help me a lot when I'd have trouble on electric. Uh, that's one thing I kind of stay away from a little bit is electricity. I was afraid of it. I didn't know much about it. Anyways, I said, Milt, I have so many pipes to put up here and all the way to the ceiling. I don't know where to start. And Milt told me, and this is something that I say a lot to people, it doesn't matter where you start, Bob. You just start and you'll work yourself in a circle and you'll come right back to that spot. And I do that today. Yep. If I'm out doing a lawn, I say, oh, I got such a mess there, where do I start? Doesn't matter. Yep, yep. So that's what it is. So, so I always remember milk by that. Yeah, good advice there. Uh -huh. so, so I read about dry cleaning that really, they, they find originations of dry cleaning all the way back to ancient civilization time when textiles were first used for clothing. Um, and then when your dad comes into the business in 29 to you taking over in 71 and by the time you retire, has the technology changed much or is it pretty much the same concept of what your dad would have known? Yeah, it's basically the same concept, except they have a, they're trying to put a ban on PERC. California has banned it completely. PERC, perchloroethylene, 
is a great degreaser. That's what General Motors used to degrease their parts with. Okay. It's a great degreaser. And uh, they've come up with about seven or eight or ten other solvents now. And I just talked to a dry cleaner a month or two ago. And perchlorothalene is still the best out there. But they've raised the price so high that it's uh, maybe $15, $20 a gallon. They've raised it so high they're forcing cleaners to go the other way with a different solvent. Now, they get by with the other solvent. They like it, but it's not as good as perk, is what I'm told. Okay. Okay. You mentioned one competitor. Did you have other area regional competitors, or maybe you bought them all out? No, I didn't do that. Uh, when, when my father was in the business during the war, there were six dry cleaners in town. They were all busy. I remember Dad said he'd put... There a, were six dry cleaners in St. Mary's? Yes, uh-huh. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, and Dad said he put a sign in the window about 2.30 in the afternoon, no more dry cleaning today. And they had a cart in there filled way up high. And they were there till 10 o'clock at night trying to get done. Oh, my. And see, back in those days, everything had to be dry cleaned because it was mostly wool. And uh, except, as I said, the, co uh, the sheets and the bed pillows. About everything else was dry cleaned. And, uh, and, just, and just not um, clothing. There were other things that could be dry cleaned, too. Yes, uh-huh. And, and, and see, they, back in the, the, those days, the farmers would all come to town on Saturdays. Yep. They'd be here all day. And there'd be horse and buggy or whatever. And uh, they'd dress up. They'd dress up to go get a haircut. They'd dress up, and they'd wear clothes that had to be clean. And they'd get them dirty. And they'd bring their cleaning in. They'd pick up their old cleaning. Uh -huh. and, uh, and the town used to be open until 9 o'clock. Now, here's something I'll tell you that I thought was interesting. I couldn't believe it. My dad told me. He and Andy, they stayed open until 9 o'clock on Saturday. They'd shut down maybe 5 o'clock, something like that. They just, and uh, they'd take turns uh, running the store in the evening themselves. I said, how'd you do that? Well, he said... We, Andy and I take turns. Uh, he said, I took it for the first 10 years, and he took it for the second 10 years. And I said, 10 years you worked every Saturday night? He said, yes. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Oh, That's Lord. That's amazing. I remember that every Saturday, Bill Miller would come in. He was a salesman. He always smoked a cigar, and he drove Cadillacs. He was a salesman for the, uh, uh, the furniture store over in Salina, uh, Mershman Furniture. Yeah. And... Uh, he would bring his clothes in every Saturday, and then uh, and later in the evening, he'd come back and pick them up. He'd want, they'd quick service them on Saturdays. And uh, uh, I, I just remember him always coming in. Jim Brady was another old-timer, came in all the time. And, uh, but people would stop in Saturday night and shoot the bull with Dad, and Dad liked that. Yep, yep. Um, and, and, you know, we've, we've talked with uh, John Andreoni before about growing up on Spring oh, Street yes. and talked a lot about how uh, Saturday night, uh -huh. this, this was the oh. epicenter of social interaction it was great. in town. And, uh, you know, it'd be great to, to see that happen once again. Talked uh, earlier about your uh, favorite and least favorite uh, aspect of the dry cleaning business when you're a kid. What about as the owner? What was your favorite and least favorite? Well... The favorite was when uh, everything ran right. Yeah. Sometimes it seemed like on Monday, that's when it, you would have something break. Yep. You know, and you think, oh, I got, the whole, I got to get this fixed. So I always tried to stay and take care of it Monday. I didn't want to wait and put it off the next day because I had to have everything ready for when the employees came in Tuesday morning that it was ready to go. Right. So I did. So I worked a lot Monday night doing that. I tried to repair as much as I could. I learned a lot. Um, and uh, when everything ran smoothly and we got a compliment, that was nice from the customers. And having the customers come in and be able to talk to them, I loved that. Yep, yep. And uh, my least favorite was when uh, I had to let an employee go. Yep. That always hurts. And I hated to doing it, but it was my job I had to. If, if they couldn't learn the job and I couldn't teach them, then I had to let them go. Yep. Or if they were not showing up on time or something else, you know, that was probably the hardest, really. 
Yep, that, that definitely would be. Thanks I, for sharing that, uh, your favorite and least favorite moments there. Let's go to 1870, or excuse me, let's go to 1973. It's the sesquicentennial for St. Mary's. Oh, yeah. You're located right on Spring Street. What do you remember about the sesquicentennial celebration oh. for St. Mary's, and how were you involved? Uh, did you grow the beard? Yeah, I did. I did, and uh, uh, I remember Eddie Mextro. Sure. Uh, Eddie Mextro was in the parade, and he had a Abraham Lincoln suit on, a hat and a suit and everything. Well, uh, several months before that, Eddie brought that suit in to us, and uh, he wanted us to clean it. And I told him, Eddie, uh, there's some holes in it, and there's going to be more mo there's moss in this wool. Uh, he had it stored wrong. And uh, so we cleaned it, and then the, after they cleaned it, then the moth holes drop in because that's the weak fiber. It's broken. In the, and then we took it off and sent it to Ree Weavers in uh, Chicago. He wanted us to do that. So we did. We got it back, and boy, it looked sharp. And he was in the parade. We had it all pressed and everything. And he had his hat on. And I remember the stores were all decorated with ribbons and stuff. And we had ours that way. And I, that was neat. I, I really enjoyed that. And I always remember Eddie. I always liked Eddie. And boy, he knew history of this town yep. more than anybody. I wish he was here now. He knows he yep. knew a lot. And that's kind of what the MO of uh, Rider Nation Station and doing these vodcasts is to capture uh -huh. Uh, history uh, for posterity's sake, and yeah, would you know, would have loved to have been able to capture you know Eddie and the, the knowledge that he had. Um, I think I, we'll have to see if we can find it in our archives, but we've got uh, we we do have film of the sesquicentennial parade, and I remember seeing Eddie walking around in that very suit yeah. that you were talking about. Be neat if we can find that. I think a lot of people took pictures of that parade. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep, and, and this this is actual film. Uh, and, and the the thing that I can remember of the film when I first saw it that the uh, Goodyear blimp is what led the processional of the oh, parade yeah. huh. uh, down Spring Street. So pretty pretty interesting. Back to dry cleaning. As I mentioned earlier, you know I saw that dry cleaning has been around since ancient civilizations. I read that uh, currently there's thirty thousand dry cleaners uh, in the United States. Clothing styles have changed, cultural norms have changed, which you've uh, spoken about. We've become more of a disposable or a discard society. Do you think dry cleaning can make it in, in the future? Well, I think what's going to happen is what's happening now, there's less dry cleaning shops and there's more pickup stations. Mm -hmm. For instance, at a grocery store where people can still get their clothes clean and a, the dry cleaner like maybe in Lima, uh, the big city will come down and run around through here one or two days a week, pick up the dirty clothes, bring yep. the clean clothes in, and that sort of thing. Because it, it takes a lot of money to run a sh uh, dry cleaning business. Equipment, the, uh, the chemicals, and uh, the employees and everything. Yep. So I think there's going to be less dry cleaners, but there'll still be dry cleaning around. Now, uh, granted, there's uh, a lot of disposables, you can just pitch and buy new for what it costs sometimes to get right. dry clean, but it costs money to dry clean, run a dry clean shop, and if they're running a truck around, that's expensive. Right. You know, trucks aren't cheap, and labor is much higher than what it was, and maybe it should be a little higher. Uh, but I think that's what's happening yeah. now. Centralizing it a little more, making it a little more efficient yeah. uh, for today's standards. Now, if everybody had to have, like it was years ago, had to have their clothes clean. There'd still be dry cleaners. Yep, yeah. and I'm still amazed by the statement that you said uh, back during the war. There were six yeah. dry cleaners in St. Mary's. You showed me something that I've never known about you before, Bob, and that you're a national champion. Oh, well, thank you. And folks, maybe you don't know that. Maybe you're learning uh, with me here, but. Uh, Bob Herm, our guest, is uh, the 1978 and 1980 national water skiing champion. And uh, I'm fascinated by that and just want to hear a little bit more about uh, how that all evolved. Well, my father, uh, he used to play golf on Thursday afternoons. And that's when Thursday afternoons at noon? Yeah, they, yeah, they closed the Everything stores. shut down pretty uh -huh. much. Yes, when I was about eight, nine years old. I don't know about before that. Okay. And uh, he'd do things with us kids, my sister and I. 
and uh, there was a cottage that came available on the lake, uh, a piece of property that he could build a cottage on. And uh, he asked my mother, and my sister and I were looking at my mother. He says, I have the house paid for, and I have $5,000 saved up. We can either remodel your kitchen in the house here, which needs it, or we can build a cottage at the lake out at Ottawa. And mom says, oh, why don't we build a cottage? And boy, <laughs> Dean and I just were so excited uh, because we've been out to the clubhouse out there a couple of years before that each year for a few days, staying at the club, and we'd be at the beach swimming, and we just loved it out there. Yep. So they did that in 1949, and uh, we've been there ever since, spent our summers there. And uh, dad, would he quit golf so that he could spend more time with us. And then we had another sister come along, Candy. Uh, and uh, when Dad would come home from work at night, he'd bring a five-gallon can of gas, uh, which was 25 cents a gallon. He'd bring five gallons home. And uh, we'd hurry up and eat supper. And uh, I kept rushing Dad to eat. I remember my mom says, oh, don't rush him so much. Give him time for his food to digest because <laughs> I wanted to get out on the yeah. water. So. Uh, we did, and his first boat, our first boat was a, a used 19-foot Thompson strip boat. And it had a 14-horse Evinrude motor on it outboard. And we had the steering with a handle in the back. And every, when we put the boat in the water the first time in the spring, it would fill about fourth of the way up with water because the boards were all, uh, it would leak. Mm -hmm. And they didn't... Uh, it, come together yet. After it soaked up the water, it was fine. And uh, so that's how it kind of started. Huh. And we'd go out on that. He, we got an aquaplane first, and I rode that, and uh, they got me up on the skis, but I couldn't, I was so skinny and, and small that I couldn't get the line out of the water. It was dragging in the water. I remember that. And uh, so it just kind of progressed from there. But And we'd go fishing in the boat and I didn't care to fish. I just wanted to go out in the boat because he let me run the motor real slow, yeah. see? And uh, I loved that. Had that's, a lot of fun. That's awesome. And a couple of pictures that I saw, uh, what was it? Uh, some some tricks, trick skiing that you would do for oh, the champion? Yeah, what I did, ship? when I was in high school, the first year of high school, I made a flying saucer and I, I cut the back of a chair off and I put rubber on the legs of this chair, and I got up on the saucer, had the chair with me, and I set it down there, and I stood up on the chair, and then I turned around 360s on the chair. Then, after I was able to do that, I would uh, leave the chair behind, and I had a foam pillow, just a little round foam pillow my mother's, and I would put it on the saucer, and I would stand on my head while the thing was pulling me down the lake. And, uh, and then I made a pair of uh, uh, shoe skis, real short skis, when I was in high school. And I made a pair of longer trick skis. And uh, it just kind of progressed from there. Huh. And uh, I just always kept learning, trying to learn new tricks. I had a, uh, when I was in college, I had a letter sent to me from Cypress Gardens. They offered me a year-round job, water skiing down there. I was a junior in college then, and I, I, I didn't take him up on it because I was afraid if I did, I'd never finish my college, get my college education, yep. and I felt that was more important. I'm still trying to figure out uh, water skiing by standing on your head, though, Bob. Well, what I did is uh, I was on this saucer, and uh, the boat would go slow, enough just to keep it up, and I had a split rope. A handle here and a handle here, and the handles were white, red and the water was white, I remember. And I put, this, I put the uh, foam pad there, and I bent over like this and got my head down and gradually got my legs up. <laughs> Did. Now, I had to practice a lot on land to do that, and I fell a few times doing it in the water, yeah. too. But uh, I just like doing new things, and I always was uh, inquisitive and wanted to try something. Yeah. What? And you had the perfect uh, backyard, so to speak, yeah. to, to practice Grand Lake St. Mary's during That's the summertime. True. And uh, I, I want to go out on a limb and say St. Mary's has had other national water champions. We as had, well. yes. Uh, we've had uh, uh, Larry Burden. 
and we had uh, Jim Tesno, who's a lawyer over in uh -huh. uh, Solana, and he lives at, uh, um, on the south side of the lake. And then we had another guy, Greg Wilson, yep. and he and I skied a lot together. And uh, in fact, we skied uh, about every day, except maybe Sunday or took a day off for the weather or sure. to rest the body. But he, we, we skied uh, and competed against each other. It was funny because here you found two guys in the north where it's cold. We can't practice in the wintertime. Right. These guys down south, they practice in the wintertime. They had an advantage over us. So we, we did other things in the winter. We lifted weights, we played racquetball. We did that kind of stuff. And, we, and one guy would push the other guy. Yep. And uh, uh, I, I remember, uh, the, I didn't go into the Nationals in 78, my goal was to, to, my goal was always to beat Greg, and his goal was always to beat me. <laughs> I didn't care about the other guys yep. who were maybe real, real good, if they could beat me, but we were both that way, and we both wanted, and if one guy was back there on, and we were pulling him, watching in the mirror, and had our hand on the release to release him in case he fell and he wouldn't get drugged, we had to make sure we were on the ball, and that. we'd watch what he did, and then we'd go out and try that thing, and figure out how he did it, and, and I'm gonna learn that trick. So we, we, we learned, we pushed each other, and I remember when I retired, he said, I wish you would come back. He says, I'm a better skier when you're there, yeah. because we pushed each pushed other, each other. Yep. you know? Well, how neat. Well, that was not uh, going to be part of the interview at all, because I didn't know about it, but yeah. uh, he as soon as I saw it. He, he, Greg, he skied on many years after I did until a couple of years before he died. And he won several national championships. And he also holds the record in men's trick skiing. Okay. Uh, and uh, and um, uh, senior men's trick skiing. He was good. He was a good athlete. He was very coordinated. Yeah. Well, there we have it. Uh, the, the national champions of uh, water skiing from St. Mary's. And uh, thanks to Grand Lake St. Mary's for providing the uh, practice facility. Uh, I, now the final question, um, you still have the building uh, out there on 703. Uh-huh. Um, talk about the building. It's for sale. You can definitely uh, pick oh. up a building if uh, you can make something happen, right? Okay. The, the building is for sale. It's 13,000 square feet. It's 8,000 square feet on the main floor. It's got a basement of 5,000 square feet. In the basement is a, st a stairs going down it. And also there's a ramp going down it. You can drive an ATV or small forklift or a tractor and a trailer down there. <laughs> and uh, it's all basement, it was air conditioned. I, ha I did have racks on there, I, only, I have maybe one rack left that I left there. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, roof on the building is a standing sea metal, cement block, it's blown in insulation. Uh, the only wood in the building is the offices, which I think there's five offices in there and uh, the restrooms, and they're all made out, that's out of wood. So you could take all that out and have one open 8,000 square foot space. There you have it, and it's, uh, is it listed with a realtor? Yes, it's listed with Cisco Realtor. And I also have another building for sale or rent, and it's out, uh, out past the golf course on 703, and it was the former uh, Huffman poultry plant. Okay. So out by Idlewild then. Yes, uh huh. And it's seven thousand square feet. All righty. So if you're interested in uh, the old Paris Cleaners building on seven hundred three, touch base with uh, his realtor and uh, make Bob a happy guy. Hey, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. We're going to take our second commercial break, and when we come back, we're going to do the Rider Nation Station Word Association. This segment of Rider Nation Station has been brought to you by Albert Sporting Goods at 121 West Spring Street, serving the St. Mary's community since 1980. Plus One Professionals Real Estate, selling St. Mary's from the corner of Spring and Chestnut since 1982. All right, welcome back, and here we are with the Rider Nation Station Word Association with Bob Herm. How about Kellemeyer's Men's Clothing Store? Nice place out in Kellemeyer was a good businessman, uh, great personality. Uh, people liked him. Yeah, he made he made you feel good coming in there. 
And then the last word association, the ski jump on Grand Lake St. Mary's. Uh, I'll tell you something, man. Uh, approaching that ski jump at 35, 40 mile an hour, maybe 50, cutting across the wake, hit two wakes. And when you hit that ski jump, you can't be on edge like this because you'll slide right out. And when you do, you land on your back and your head and it hurts. You got to be flat. And I think almost every time I hit that jump, I was always a little scared. Sure. I wanted to, I wanted to land and not get hurt. Yeah. And, and I, I just think it's fascinating that during a period of time, Grand Lake St. Mary's had a ski jump. We first, Greg and I first learned to ski jump down in uh, Pickway on the Pickway River. A guy down there invited us down. I, I don't know where we met him or saw him or something. He invited us down and took us over the ramp. And uh, boy, was that scary. I, I can't even imagine. We had wetsuits. He had wetsuits for us to put on because it was cold. We skied a lot when there was ice on the lake. <laughs> I mean, we were that, we were that gung-ho. That's dedication. You know? We'll just go with dedication okay. on that one there. All right. All righty. The Rider Nation Station Word Association is brought to you by fine sponsors, Plus One Professionals and Albert Sporting Goods. Please stop in to see these fine folks. Stay local the best you can. And definitely tell them thanks for supporting Rider Nation Station. Real quick interactive correspondence from two shows ago about Prof. Kohler. Good job on the comments section on Facebook and YouTube from Dolores Schmiel. I remember Prof. as a wonderful teacher. I graduated in 48, but the story I would like to tell was he had great respect for the boys that returned from the war and went back to school to get their diploma. He always told the students if they did not want to learn to leave for there was some out there that did. He was the greatest teacher I had, and I had high respect for the man that enjoyed teaching. Also a comment from Michael Holdren, class of 66. Prof. Kohler was one of my favorite teachers. He taught more than just getting an education. He called me Ringo back then because I refused to get my hair cut sh to short to standard cut. The school was against me, but he stood for my rights. He was a very intelligent teacher. Please keep your questions or comments coming in for the interactive correspondence. Submit the comments section on Facebook or YouTube or email to writernationstation at gmail.com. Well, we have come to the end of our show. It is our hope at Writer Nation Station. This podcast did entertain, educate, enlighten, and elevate your perspective about St. Mary's, Ohio. We hope a story has been told that augments the development of relationships, old and new, to promote growth for all who do, did and will call St. Mary's Ohio home. Again, I want to thank Bob Herm for providing us a history lesson on the family owned business of Paris Cleaners. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Next Tuesday, we will, be, we will be discussing athletics and we will have a conversation with St. Mary's first state champion, my sister, Laura Yelton. I hope you think positively about our town the town we did not inherit from our ancestors, but the town we borrowed from our grandchildren. Peace to you, my fellow St. Marians, always and always. Thanks again, Bob. Hey, you're welcome. Thank you. This episode of Rider Nation Station has been sponsored by American Manufacturing Solutions, your total logistic partner, investing in the St. Mary's community. Albert Sporting Goods at 121 West Spring Street, serving the St. Mary's community since 1980. Plus One Professionals Real Estate, selling St. Mary's from the corner of Spring and Chestnut since 1982. Minster Bank, helping people achieve financial success and supporter of the Ryder Nation and the St. Mary's community. The Evening Leader, chronicling the history of St. Mary's for over 100 years. Like a good neighbor, Lori Yelton, your local State Farm agent is there.